morning. Today I will explain the lecture entitled Shelf Life. In this lecture, we will explain the meaning of the term shelf life. We will discuss the factors that affect the shelf life and what are the ways that can extend the shelf life of the food. We will start with the learning objective, starting by defining the shelf life, differentiating between best before date and use by date, what are the changes that may occur during processing and storage. We will explain the direct and indirect methods of shelf life determination, what are the factors affecting the shelf life, and last but not least, what are the ways that we can use to extend the shelf life of the food. So to define the shelf life, what is the shelf life? The shelf life is a period of time uh, a product can be stored until degradation occurs. So the shelf life of the food will end whenever the food will become undesirable or unfit for human consumption, or whenever we are facing any change in the flavor, in the smell, texture, or appearance of the food. So the shelf life is a, a, a period of time that takes into that take into consideration not only the safety of the food but as well the quality aspects of the food. So. The quality means all what is organolactic characteristics, means flavor, smell, texture, and appearance. So a food that has reached the end of its shelf life can be uh, uh, still unsafe, but has any kind of degradation of quality characteristics. So what defines the shelf life is three aspects, sensory aspect, nutritional aspect, as well as the psychological aspect. So we ask three questions. Is it edible? Is it nutritious? And is it safe? So we have some new terms that we are going to introduce in this slide related to shelf life. So first of all, we have the term best before. Best before, you use it for the shelf life whenever uh, uh, the food uh, uh, is a stable food. So the food from a safety point of view is very stable. We don't have a problem. However, from a quality point of view, the food can face degradation of quality characteristics. So it's more a... Uh, it's more a quality aspect shelf life than a safety aspect shelf life, and it's used for shelf-stable food. So when I say shelf-stable food, I mean the foods that are low in moisture, that are dry and high in salt or sugar content, uh, that do not require uh, refrigeration, such as spices, flour, dried pasta, but even canned food can be considered as shelf-stable food, such as canned fish or meat. And we have as well the used by date. So the used by date is the date that we use here in Lebanon by a stamping production expiry date on our products. So here the used by date is more a safety aspect date. So the food will reach its shelf life by the end of this date. So when we say expiry, so expiry date is the last day where we can consume the food from a safety point of view. So it's more used for perishable food, the food that are high in moisture, low in acids, such as dairy product and meat. So we can use this decision tree to determine when to use a use by date and when to use a BBD best before date by asking a series of questions starting from the step, step one. Is the food a shelf stable food? If yes, we use a BBD. If no, we go to the second question. Is the food a frozen food? If yes, again, a BBD, it's stable. If no, we go to the step number three. Is the food a raw food that requires a process such as cooking to reduce or eliminate food poisoning bacteria to make the food safe to eat? If yes, BBD. If no, next question. Is the food a child ready to eat food? If no, BBD. If yes, here we need to check whether there is a probability or a reasonable likelihood that the food contains any of the following food poisoning bacteria such as Listeria, Bacillus cereus, Clostridium botulinum, or Gerstinia. If no, BBD. If yes, we go to the step number six. Will the food spoil before the levels of bacteria will reach dangerous level? If yes, BBD. And if no, used by date. So here I'm going to show you some scenarios to be able to decide whether to use a BBD or a used by date. So this is scenario A. Food supports the growth of uh, pathogenic and spoilage bacteria during storage. However, the food can reach unsafe level from a bacteria point of view before the food is visibly spoiled from a quality point of view. So if you check the graph, the graph presents the number of microorganisms in function of the storage time, in function of the shelf life. So as you can see, the time where the food reach the unsafe level is before where the food reach the spoilage level. And here we use a used by date because it's more a safety aspect. Scenario B, food supports the growth of both pathogenic and spoilage bacteria during storage, but the food is visibly spoiled before pathogenic bacteria reach unsafe level. Here we use the BBD level because the food does not cross the threshold of safety. Scenario C, the pathogenic bacteria may sometimes be present at very low safe level, but do not grow in the food. Spoilage bacteria can grow and the food becomes visibly spoiled. Here we use a BBT.
So what are the changes that may occur during processing and storage? Here I'm going to talk about certain aspects of deterioration of spoilage. I'm going to talk as well about the factors that affect the rate at which food deteriorates and spoils. What are the processes uh, used in food premises and how do they affect the survival of microorganisms? We're going to talk as well about the effects of chilling and what are the losses of nutrients that might occur during storage. So starting by deterioration and spoilage, we need to know that the more the food is high in moisture and low in acid, the more it is susceptible to become spoiled easily. So for some food such as retorted food and very dry food, the deterioration in the quality So, uh, what are the um, uh, factors that may affect the deterioration and spoilage of the food? The food is perishable by nature whenever it's high in moisture, it's low in acid, and uh, uh, in this case, the spoilage can take place over a period of days or weeks, such as bread. It becomes moldy easily. However, retorted and very dry food, they are very stable, they are shelf life stable, and uh, they can maintain their quality and safety over a longer period of time. Could be sometimes years of storage as well. The canning food, they can stay a uh, two years of storage. So what are the uh, factors that affect the rate at which the food deteriorate as spoils? We have many factors. Some of them are intrinsic, some others are extrinsic. Intrinsic such as the uh, moisture, uh, such as the pH, and extrinsic such as the packaging material and storage conditions. Okay, so we need to understand more these factors to be able to check how do they affect the shelf life of the food. Effect of processing on survival of microorganisms. So we will see that we have different processes that can be used. And these processes, they can affect the safety as well as the quality of the food by reducing the number of spoilage microorganisms. So, um, here in this table, I'm going to show you some processes and how do they affect the food safety and the food quality of the food, starting by the washing of raw materials. So, if you start with the washing of raw material, the washing, uh, how does it affect the microorganism, the vegetative bacteria, as well as the bacteria spores? So, the vegetative bacteria and the bacteria spores will be slightly reduced. From a point of view, uh, checking the impact of the food safety, it will improve the food safety. However, when we use a high amount of water, the food becomes wet and it can be get spoiled easily. From a shelf life point of view, really the effect is really variable. It depends on the washing technique because sometimes it may damage the surfaces which would allow microbial growth and would decrease the shelf life. Passing to the cooking, including baking. So here definitely the cooking will reduce the number of germinated vegetative bacteria. However, no effect on spores because the cooking temperature is not very high. It's not like the sterilization temperature. So it doesn't present any effect on the uh, uh, spores and it will not activate the germination of spores. Impact of food safety, uh, so definitely from a perspective of pathogenic bacteria, it will reduce the numbers, so more food safety. However, as long as it's not affecting the spores, so uh, also the effect is variable. From a shelf life point of view, it will be extended unless the spores are able to germinate. So in this case, it will not extend the shelf life that much. Cooling, the cooling will uh, present a minimal reduction of uh, vegetative bacteria. Potential for spores to germinate because the cooling will uh, uh, induce water 
and water is good for bacterial germination. So spores forming bacteria will germinate if cooling is not really well, very well managed, and the shelf life uh, decreased if cooling is not very well managed. Pasteurization, it will decrease the number of germinated bacteria, of vegetative bacteria, no decrease on the spores, improvement of food safety, and extended shelf life. The UHD, aseptic processing, uh, mainly used for milk, so it will inactivate the bacteria and the spores. Definitely from the food safety point of view, the food will become low risk, and we have here a significant extension of shelf life. Same same for the canning and retorting, okay, which is the sterilization. Heldel technique, so uh, variable effect. It depends on the herdel technique because sometimes we can combine high salt with low pH, nitrate, high sugar fermentation, and decreasing moisture or drying by drying. So variable effect on spores, a variable effect on bacteria as well. In combination, most of the time it will enhance the food safety level and will extend the shelf life. Addition of preservatives, it will prevent the increase of microorganism. No effect on spores will in improve the food safety and we may provide shelf life extension by inhibiting spoilage. Salting, drying, and pickling will inhibit the growth of bacteria, no effect on spores, better food safety, and shelf life extended. Packaging and MPP modified atmosphere packaging where you can like flash nitrogen or CO2 to replace uh, oxygen will inhibit the growth of bacteria, variable on spores, enhance the food safety level, and extend it as long as conditions remain unchanged. Storage temperature when we talk about chilling, so it will decrease the growth of the food. It will um, not that much affect the spores, enhance food safety, and extend the shelf life. So what about the effect of chilling on storage? So here uh, we can say that chilling definitely will retard the growth of bacteria. However, so we have some cold tolerant pathogen. When I say cold tolerant, it means that they can grow even uh, at very low temperatures, such as Bacillus cereus. Uh, at a temperature less than four, they can grow. They can grow even in the absence of oxygen. They are anaerobic. Uh, they can grow even at a water activity lower than 0 0.91 and a pH less than 4.3, okay? For Clostridium botulinum, almost the same. Listeria also, they present a good uh, 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 tolerance to cold. They can resist the cold and grow. Uh, and they grow in the presence and absence of oxygen, so they are uh, uh, really presenting some resistance. Same for listeria. So losses of nutrient during storage, definitely the nutrient level can be decreased over the time, and the rate of loss will depend on the stability of a particular nutrient. So here we can, we need to check even the storage conditions, such as humidity, such as exposure to light. We have plenty of factors that can contribute in reducing uh, uh, or losing nutrients here, and mainly pinpointing vitamins. So what is the shelf life study? So here, if I can tell you how do, do we manage to uh, uh, to uh, to agree on a shelf life, we have many uh, ideas to be kept in mind. We have many factors that can contribute, but basically we need to rely on a proper study. We need to rely on a proper calculation. So we do with what is called shelf life studies. So they are conducted on various types of products to determine the length of time where the product will retain its quality, its safety. So basically including acceptable microbial counts, acceptable taste, appearance, vitamin level, and odor. And the shelf life study will determine the best buy date for your product. So what are the different types of shelf life study? We have microbiological studies, organoleptic, physical and chemical, microbiological, organoleptic, physical and chemical. So when I say micro, I mean all what is safety. So here you have to check all the spoiled microorganisms as well as the bacterial load. When I say organoleptic, here we need to rely on a, a jury panel, on a tasting panel to check on sensory attributes such as color, appearance, odor, taste, and texture. So generally we, we have, we can recruit like eight to 10 experienced panelists, but study is designed around your needs. So shelf life study would typically end when the product is disliked or unacceptable to the panelists anymore.
physical and chemical he will be neutral and chemical analysis to uh, check the vitamin and mineral content the nutritional content the oxidation of fat and oil separation characteristic and rancidity and by combining the three factors physical chemical microbiological and organoleptic we can agree on a combination of all types of shelf life studies and we can uh, typically add by evaluating the fails the failure and any of the aspect to be able to agree on one shelf life so it should be customized to meet your needs so what are the approaches to shelf life estimation so we really need to understand the food we really need to understand all what is biochemical physical chemical biological reactions happening in the food we really need to understand also the chemical reaction from a food chemistry point of view all what is the spoilage all what is losses in the texture flavor odor nutrients of flavors of odors so with a better understanding of all these mechanisms we can definitely estimate the period of shelf life where the food will maintain its quality safety aspect so if i ask you what are the approaches that can be used to determine a shelf life we have plenty of approaches so first of all we can start by estimating shelf life based on published data so we can see published data for a similar product just to take an idea about the shelf life but we can never use the, the same shelf life because we need to know that the shelf life is typically uh, uh, related to the, cons the consistency of the food to the composition of the food to the standardized recipe so if i take two let's say yogurt uh, from different brands definitely they do not have the same water activity they do not have the same acidity they do not have the same packaging materials and all the of these factors they can affect the quality and the safety of the food and consequently present a different shelf life so estimating shelf life based on published data is one of the approaches we can see similar products on the market as i already mentioned to see like to take an idea about the shelf life we can use consumer complaints to determine if we have any kind of problem and we can use the accelerated shelf life testing that i'm going to explain later on so why do we conduct a shelf life study and what are the benefits uh, uh, behind uh, conducting a shelf life study first of all to be more confident about the food so it's not only an estimation we are really confident about the shelf life that we are using to prevent recalls to maintain quality to protect the brand to improve profitability and to avoid expensive litigation consumer safety so how to determine shelf life we have two main approaches that can be used we, we can use what is called direct method uh, and uh, we have what is called indirect method so direct method may take longer but will be most accurate in direct method they are quicker but they are less accurate so simply we know that we have some products that present a short shelf life so when we go short shelf life we go directly to direct method we can do a real shelf life monitoring we can do a real quality safety micro uh, vitamins monitoring day by day since the shelf life is short however if we are estimating a shelf life for a product like a canned tuna product presenting a uh, shelf life around two years in the market so here we are dealing with two years of shelf life we cannot do what is called direct method we need to rely on indirect method we need to rely on estimation of the shelf life and here we go to the accelerated method that i'm going to talk later on about it but keep in mind that it's always obligatory to run the, uh, the direct method in parallel with the indirect method so when we do direct method alone it's fine for perishable product for stable product we can do indirect method to get the estimation to launch the product in the market but still we we, sh we should do the direct method to make sure that we don't have any kind of uh, problem in the marketplace so direct method or real-time method uh, uh, it is uh, used for a period of time that is longer than the expected shelf life so few days a uh, uh, few, few weeks uh, so it's it's mainly suitable for uh, short shelf life for longer ones it's not practical so benefits we don't have calculation we are just relying on numbers uh, it's uh, it's a precise condition it's very accurate it's expensive and take uh, time takes time application product with short shelf life so what are the steps we have three steps we start by setting up the study by doing the study by setting the date mark and verification and review so setting up the study first of all we need to be more much more familiar with the type of the food so we need to do our homework to see what kind of microbes can grow in this food what kind of chemical reaction can happen in the food we need to get more and more 
familiar with the complex of chemical, biochemical, uh, physical chemical uh, reactions happening in the food. So definitely we should use published literature to be more familiar. We should do our homework to check the marketplace. We should decide on the storage condition that we are going to use because uh, let's say if we are talking about a shelf life of, uh, I don't know, of cheese. So definitely we should study the shelf life of cheese and the refrigerator because typically we will sell it and then we will distribute it and dispatch and sell in the refrigerators and under chilling conditions. So we cannot do the homework at room temperature and then extrapolate it. So uh, uh, we really need to reflect the norm expected conditions of distribution and storage to make the trials, okay? We calculate the total number of samples needed for the trial and we start doing the study. How we do the study, as I already mentioned, we have three bulks of analysis to be done. We take a group of people working on microbiological assessment, a group working on sensory assessment, and a group working on physical chemical assessment. And the three groups will work in parallel, but take a lot of samples. And by assessing all of these, and they have to agree day by day whether we have any kind of decline in any of the aspects. Whenever we have any kind of decline, automatically we go, we put like a... Uh, a time frame would take a tolerance period like two days before or one day before it depends on the product and we set the shelf life on this day so we calculate the shelf life of the observation made the earliest time at which small storage occurs the time at which 50 percent of the sample have unacceptable loss of a major or several quality attributes so the study should repeat it at least three times from different three batches and if there is a large amount of variability between batches, we need to work out how to reduce variability. So we need to determine the product date marking. We take a safety margin, as I already mentioned. A safety margin is needed because the shelf life is not an approximation and not a fixed value, and it will vary from time to time. That's why we need to take into consideration a safety margin of the shelf life. Retention sample. One production will start with a retain sample, ideally from each batch. So as I already mentioned, we need to run, uh, uh, we need to keep samples even after launching the product in the market. We need also to, to check all the time the stability of the food. We need to rely big time on consumer complaints to check the feedback from the market, whether the product is presenting any kind of fluctuation, any kind of problem in the market. We need to monitor customer complaint. Customer complaint. We have to review on a regular basis for trends, for evidence of shelf life, for any kind of failure. We need to check the distribution chain effect and the retailers, which are the supermarkets. We repeat the shelf life test if there are any kind of major changes made to the product composition, ingredient, process or packaging. So passing to the indirect method, if you remember during the first lecture, I talked about Arrhenius. Arrhenius was a food chemist who believed that whenever we increase the temperature 10 degrees Celsius, automatically this will double the spoilage of the reaction. Based on this formula, so simply, if we have a product at room temperature, if we store the product in an incubator by increasing the temperature, we are accelerating the spoilage. When you accelerate the spoilage, so you are to shortening the shelf life. By a ca calculation, we can extrapolate and reflect the real shelf lifetime. But keep in mind definitely that the shelf life that we have at room temperature should definitely be longer than the shelf life at a higher temperature, okay? So it's called accelerated. We are trying to accelerate. It's not a real shelf life. Uh, we are accelerating by, if, by varying the conditions of storage. So it's mainly used for products with a long shelf life. Accelerated study may be performed in the product is exposed to elevated temperature to hasten the development of spoilage and deterioration and shorten the time the study takes. However, it's only useful if the spoilage patterns remain the same as for the normal storage condition. So we need to get an expert help and we need to vary 10 degree of difference. So benefits, avoid running a full length storage trial, see the impact of any changes become sooner, application mainly for long shelf life. So this is Arrhenius equation, as I already mentioned, a 10 degree rise in the temperature will double the rate of the reaction, food cooks faster in pressure cooker, and that's why we need to use this temperature. So I will go directly to the, uh, to the last two slides. So simply, I will explain the two methods that we can work on, okay, to calculate the shelf life. We have a simplified method and we have the Arrhenius method, okay? So as you can see, all the time we use Q10. Q10 by default should be number two because if I say that an increase in 10 degrees Celsius will double the rate of reaction, so Q10 is a two factor, number two. So what do we take into consideration? As per Arrhenius method, we need to take into consideration the accelerated aging rate. 
So the accelerated aging uh, rate is the shelf life in the accelerator. We have the AATD, the accelerated aging time duration, okay? We have the desired real time, the shelf life at ambient temperature. We have T ambient temperature and T accelerated, the elevated temperature, okay? So Q10 is the reaction rate, AAR, so the shelf life accelerated is the Q10, it's 2, to the power 2, T accelerated minus T ambient temperature over 10, okay? And the AATD, the accelerated aging time duration is the desired real time uh, divided by AAR. So if we go to the simplified one, simply Q10 to is R ambient, so the shelf life at the real temperature, divided by R accelerated, shelf life at accelerated temperature, to the power of 10, divided by T accelerated minus T ambient. So if we go to this scenario, if we destroy it at 25, at a shelf life of 6 hours, what is the accelerated shelf life of this product at 5 degree? Noting that Q10 is equal 3. So AAR equals 3. Uh, to the power to 2 accelerated 5 minus 25 over 10, so t to the power minus 2, so 6 over 3 to the power minus 2, 54 hours. If we go to the simplified method, q10 equals 3, it's 6 r ambient shelf life at room temperature divided by r accelerated 54 uh, hours uh, over minus 0 0.5, so r accelerated is 54 hours and r ambient is six hours, okay? So let's go to the, uh, so here you can see we have many, uh, we have more explanation, you can read them, but definitely it's better to rely on the uh, last uh, two slides. So the lower the temperature, the better it is, the higher the temperature, the worse it is. And what are the factors affecting the shelf life and the quality of the food? Starting from the microbial load, passing to the moisture, pH, water activity, definitely the fat, oil, alcohol content, the packaging, effect, light exposure, storage temperature. So to sum up, what are the factors affecting the shelf life? We have some factors inherent to the matrix of the food. We have some factors external to the matrix of the food. So inherent to the matrix of the food, the nature of the quality of the raw materials. So if the raw material is already contaminated, definitely it will contaminate the whole food. If the raw material is already spoiled, same, same. If it's high in sugar, how it will act, high in salt, high in water activity, etc. Product formulation. So here we we're mainly talking about the standardized recipe, how we'll manage to, like, to d decrease the water activity activity, increase the pH. Product structure. What is the structure of the product and how it will affect the availability of oxygen, the water content, and the pH? What about the external factor, the processes applied to the food, the cooling method, type of packaging, storage temperature, and condition during distribution, storage, retail, and uh, this, this dispatching. So good quality raw material with a low load of microorganisms definitely will help in extending the shelf life and in providing consistent acceptable shelf life. But if the raw material we are using is already heavily contaminated, this will trigger contaminating during, during the combination during the whole process. If we're talking about the formula itself, the standardized recipe, the more I'm using preservative, the more I will protect the product. And the more I'm using preservative, the more I'm inhibiting the growth of bacteria. So if you are thinking to replace, substitute, remove a certain ingredient, uh, um, adding preservative, adding antioxidant, replacing sugar with a sweetener, adding vinegar, adding acid, removing nitrates, uh, reducing the amount of salt, uh, using hurdle technique, all of these will affect and control the microorganism, consequently affecting the shelf life. Product structure. What is the structure of the product? Is it liquid? Is it semi-solid? Is it gel? What kind of coating are we using? So if we give here an example, herbs and spices on the surface of a pate, the herbs will exclude air. By excluding air, will prevent the mold growth, okay? So if we are the pastry crust covering a meat pie, we'll make the content anaerobic, okay? But will allow bacterial spores, such as phosphatidium perfringens associated with meat, to germinate and growth. However, anaerobic condition is less likely or less likely with the potato topping. So it's really important to understand the structure of the product to see its effect on the shelf life of the food. Oxygen availability within the food. So this has a major effect. Uh, the more the food presents a um, high exposure to oxygen, this will trigger enzymatic browning, this will trigger oxidation, this will trigger uh, the growth of aerobic bacteria, this will trigger loss of vitamins, browning, product deterioration, rancidity. So molds need oxygen to grow. This will what accelerate the spoilage of the food. 
changes in the water content. So you know, the more we have water activity, the more this will trigger hydrolysis in the food from a food chemistry point of view. But the more we have water, this will also uh, enhance the growth of microorganisms. So hydrolytic tenacity, enzymatic browning will be increasing. Water can be removed for drying, smoking, salting, adding sugar, and oxygen and water can be prevent from reacting with the food by adding a vacuum or uh, like a, a gas, any kind of gas, pH. So the more we increase the pH, uh, uh, the acidity will be lower. The more we increase the acidity by lowering the pH, the more we can control the activity of the enzymes, the more we can control the activity of the bacteria. Noting that the bacteria are acidophilic. They don't really care about low pH. They can still survive and they can still grow. So reducing the pH will inhibit microbial enzymatic activity and has been widely practiced practiced for many years. So what about the extrinsic factors? Starting from the retorted processes by using sterilization, we can destroy the bacteria. And generally, the more the intense the process is, the longer the shelf life we can provide. Cooling is very important. So cooling should directly follow any kind of pasteurization, sterilization technique. But cooling should be very rapid uh, and uh, should not uh, like a uh, uh, so if the food is not cooled rapidly after the heat treatment, we will keep the food under the danger zone, and this will shorten the shelf life. Type of packaging, here we're talking about the MAP conditions, modified atmosphere packaging, vacuum packaging, glass flushing, gas flushing, when we flush another gas, and this gas, um, uh, since it's not oxygen, uh, uh, will not allow the growth of bacteria and will not allow oxidation, and this will extend the shelf life. Hi. لا بدكم تفوتوا سكانر بدي 10 دقائق لكن 5 دقائق وخلصت لانه عم بعمل فيديو ولكتشر عشان ما يطلع اصوات عرفت خمس دقائق هلا بقول لك اوكي So, uh, storage temperature, definitely storage temperature uh, will affect. So, uh, the more we are controlling the chilling chain, the uh, less uh, the bacteria will grow. Uh, so, the more we increase the temperature, the, the more the bacteria will grow. And definitely, we should, as you know, that the temperature will not affect only the bacterial growth. It will affect as well the enzyme. So, above 60, the enzyme can be denatured, but at a very low temperature, the enzyme will be uh, uh, active. So light, uh, the light will affect the product, uh, acidity, fading of the color, oxidation of nutrients. So light will initiate oxidation of fat and oil and acidity, uh, uh, losses of vitamins and nutrients. Uh, we should maintain uh, conditions during distribution, storage, retail, and um, the display to the consumer by controlling temperatures, UV light, humidity, uh, and uh, we should make sure not to avoid the freezer burn also factor. So what are the methods that we use for shelf life, for extending the shelf life, food preservation? So starting from the very traditional method, starting from the drying, freeze drying, pickling, passing to pasteurization, fermentation, dehydration, irradiation, canning, refrigeration, and freezing. So food preservation is very important because when we preserve the food, we destroy the bacteria and this will extend the shelf life. So how does the food preservation work? By increasing temperature, by reducing water activity, and by reducing pH. By manipulating these three factors, we can extend the shelf life of the food. So pickling, fermentation, salting, and sugar preserve are very traditional methods that we use to extend the shelf life. Pickling by increasing the acidity, fermentation by increasing the acidity through releasing uh, acid, okay? So beneficial microorganisms can be used to uh, release acid or to release alcohol, uh, such as lactic acid, acetic acid. Uh, or such as ethanol during alcoholic fermentation that will limit growth of bacteria in wine and a higher alcohol concentration. Salting, so salting will, uh, so salt by default will reduce the water content and uh, the, the effect is to create osmotic pressure at a level which will prevent microorganism development. So coating food in salt or closing in a pie solution will cause dehydration and dehydration will extend the shelf life of the food. It's a matter of osmosis, a pressure, uh, that will uh, uh, tend to equalize the solute concentration. Sugar preserve, it works such as the salting, so it's mainly in jam, in order to reduce the water content and preserve the food. The concentration of 60% is really enough to assure food preservation. So the high concentration of sugar added during jam make the water unavailable, reducing the water activity below 0.84, and this will extend the food. Thank you so much for your attention.